Welcome back to Anne of Green Gables, chapters 34 and 35. A Queen's Girl, page 271 to 277, and A Winter at Queen's, page 278 to 282. The words are fits, shuring, bitterest, untenant, untenanted, pessimistic, pessimistically, garret, objectionable, tramp, and I put of alien feet because that was part of it, but it's not the word. Aggravating, kerwallops, goose or goosey. BA, which stands for Bachelor of Arts. Satchel, comrades, conceptions, byways, ambitious, aerial, handsomest. Preeminence, Sari Barons, Philosophically, Eddie Chaplet. Question number one. What does Matthew mean when he said there was no, there never was a luckier mistake than what Mrs. Spencer made? Number two, what did Marilla do after Anne left? Number three, why wasn't Anne able to stay with Mrs. Barry? And we're talking Mrs. Barry as in Diana's aunt, right? Number four, what does Anne decide to do? Question number five. When the weather cooperates, what do Avonlea students do every Friday? Question number six. Who does Gilbert walk with? Question number seven. What happened after the Christmas holidays? Question number eight. According to the other students, who were the three medal contenders? Okay. Here we go. We are. We're getting super close. A Queen's Girl. The next three weeks were busy ones at Green Gables, for Anne was getting ready to go to Queen's, and there was much sewing to be done and many things to be talked over and arranged. Anne's outfit was ample and pretty, for Matthew saw to that. And Marilla, for once, made no objections whatever to anything he purchased or suggested. More, one evening she went up to the east gable with her arms full of a delicate pale green material. Anne, here's something for a nice light dress for you. I don't suppose you really need it. You have plenty of pretty waist. And remember waist was the tops of the dresses, right? Plenty of pretty waist, but I thought maybe you'd like something real dressy to wear if you were asked out anywhere of an evening in town to a party or anything like that. I hear Jane and Ruby and Josie have got evening dresses as they call them, and I don't mean you shall be behind them. I got Mrs. Allen to help me pick it in town last week, and we'll get Emily Gillis to make it for you. Emily has got taste and her fits aren't to be equaled. And you know what, I just realized I don't think this is the right fit. Because I was thinking fit as in anger, but it's really not a fit of anger. It's going to be the, like, if you're trying to make something fit right, it's the size. size. So this, in this case, this fit is talking about the size or the sizes. So if you go and get something that's tailored, you're going to get it sized just to you. Or if you go to get a wedding dress, a lot of times they will alter it to you. Okay? What? All right. Oh, Marilla, it's just lovely, said Anne. Thank you so much. I don't believe you ought to be so kind to me. It's making it harder every day for me to go away. The green dress was made up with as many tucks and frills and shearings, and we've already done this one, I forgot, which are decorative gathering as, of, as in cloth, 
as Emily's taste permitted. Anne put it on one evening for Matthew and Marilla's benefit and recited the maiden's vow for them in the kitchen. As Marilla watched the bright animated face and graceful motions, her thoughts went back to the evening Anne had arrived at Green Gables. And memory recalled a vivid picture of the odd, frightened child in her preposterous yellow-brown wincy dress. The heartbreak looking out over her of out of her tearful eyes. Something in the memory brought tears to Marilla's own eyes. I declare my recit rec recitation has made you cry, Marilla, said Anne gaily, stooping over Marilla's chair to drop a butterfly kiss on the lady's cheek. Now I call that positive triumph. No, I wasn't crying over your piece, said Marilla, who would have scorned to be betrayed in such a weakness by any poetry stuff. I just couldn't help thinking of the little girl you used to be, Anne, and I was wishing you could have stayed a little girl, even with all your queer ways. You've grown up now and you're going away and you look so tall and stylish and so, so different altogether in that dress, as if you didn't belong in Avonlea at all. And I just got lonesome thinking it all over. Marilla! Anne sat down on Marilla's gingham lap, took Marilla's lined face between her hands, and looked gravely and tenderly into Marilla's eyes. I'm not a bit changed, not really. I'm only just pruned down and branched out. The real me back here is just the same. It won't make a bit of difference where I go or how much I change outwardly. At heart, I shall always be your little Anne, who will love you and Matthew and dear Green Gables more and better every day of her life. Anne laid her fresh young cheek against Marilla's faded one and reached out her out a hand to put Ma on, to pat Matthew's shoulder. Marilla would have given much just then to have possessed Anne's power of putting her feelings into words, but nature and habit had willed it otherwise, and she could only put her arms close about her girl and hold her tenderly to her heart wishing that she need never let her go. Matthew, with a suspicious moisture in his eyes, got up and went out of doors. Under the stars of the blue summer night, he walked agitatedly across the yard to the gate under the poplars. Well, now, I guess she ain't been much spoiled, he muttered proudly. I guess my put in my oar in occasionally never did much harm after all. She's smart and pretty and loving, too, which is better than all the rest. She's been a blessing to us, and there never was a luckier mistake than, the, than what Mrs. Spencer made, if it was luck. I don't believe in any such thing. It was Providence, because the Almighty saw we needed her, I reckon. The day finally came when Anne must go to town. She and Matthew drove in one fine September morning after a tearful parting with Diana and an untearful practice, practical one on Marilla's side at least, with Marilla. But when Anne had gone, Diana dried her tears and went to a beach picnic at White Sands with some of her Carmody cousins where she contrived to enjoy herself tolerably well while Marilla plunged fiercely into unnecessary work and kept at it all day long with the bitterest, uh, accompanied by severe pain or suffering, bitterest kind of heartache, the ache that burns and gnaws and cannot wash itself away in ready tears. But that night when Marilla went to bed, acutely and miserably conscious that the little gable room at the end of the hall was untenanted, or not leased or occupied by a tenant, so basically Anne's no longer living there, by any vivid young life and unstirred by any soft breathing, she buried her face in her pillow and wept for her little girl in a passion of sobs that appalled her when she grew calm enough to reflect how very wicked it must be to take on so about a sinful fellow creature. Anne and the rest of the Avonlea scholars reached town just in time to hurry off to the academy. The first day passed pleasantly enough in a whirl of excitement, meeting all the new students, learning how to know the professors by sight, 
and being assorted and organized into classes. Anne intended taking up the second year work, being advised to do so by Miss Stacy. Gilbert Blythe elected to do the same. So basically, instead of starting with the first year of school, she's jumping right to the second year of school. So in some ways, she's like skipping a grade, right? Do you think it's going to be easier? Or do you think it must be super hard? Super hard. Be like you guys jumping sixth grade and going straight to the high school. I'm seeing some no thanks. Um, this meant, meant getting a first class teacher's license in one year instead of two if they were successful, but it also meant much more and harder work. Jane, Ruby, Josie, Charlie, and Moody Spurgeon, not being troubled with the stirrings of ambition, were content to take up the second class work. Um, Anne was conscious of a pain of loneliness when she found herself in a room with 50 other students, not one of whom she knew except the tall, brown-haired boy across the room, and knowing him in the fashion she did, did not help her much as she reflected pessimistically. Who's across the room? Gilbert. Gilbert. Pessimistically, of relating to or characterized by pessimism or gloomy. Yet she was undeniably glad they were in the same class. The old rivalry could still be carried on. And Anne would hardly have known what to do if it had been lacking. I wouldn't feel comfortable without it, she thought. Gilbert looks awfully determined. I suppose he's making up his mind here and now to win the medal. What a splendid chin he has. I never noticed it before. I do wish Jane and Ruby had gone in for, in for first class, too. So it sounds like instead of starting with first class and then going to second class, um... Like they start in second class and then they go to first class or they jump second class and go right to first class. Usually we start with the low end and then go high, right? And they're starting with the high end and going low. I suppose I won't feel so much like a cat in a strange garret when I get acquainted. Garret is a room or unfinished part of the house just under the roof. Though, I wonder which of the girls here are going to be my friends. It's really an interesting speculation. Of course, I promised Diana that no Queen's girl, no matter how much I liked her, should ever be as dear to me as she is, but I have a lot of second best affections to bestow. I like the look of that girl with the brown eyes and the crimson waist, so the red shirt, right? She looks vivid and red rosy, and there's the, that pale, fair one gazing out the window. She has lovely hair and looks as if she knew a thing or two about dreams. I'd like to know them both, know them well. Well enough to walk with my arm about their waist and call them nicknames. But just now, I don't know them, and they don't know me, and probably don't want to know me particularly. Oh, oh, it's so lonesome. How do you guys figure out who you want to talk to when you go into a room where you've never met anybody before? Okay, so if you're the new person, you go in, you look around to see if there's anybody you might be, want to be friends with. Okay, you'd go and look them around, look around, and then at what, what, what'd you say before, ask them? They look nice. Oh, if they look see nice? If nice or kind. Oh, okay, so see if they're a nicer kind. That's a good idea. You're going to just keep doing what you're doing? Oh, so you're going to wait for them to come up to talk to you. That's a strategy. Yep, that's, that's an option. All right. Mm -hmm. 
It was lonesomer still when Anne found herself alone in her hall bedroom that night at twilight. So twilight, remember, is when the dusk, when it's like dusk outside. She was not too bored with other girls who, she was not too bored with other, the other girls who all had relatives in town to take pity on them. So if you go to somebody, if you go to a, to a different town or a different city and there's a relative there, usually you stay at their house, right? So everybody, all the other girls have some relative they can stay with. Anne has to board at a boarding house. Miss Josephine Berry would have liked to board, to board her, but Beechwood was so far from the academy that it was out of the question. So Miss Berry hunted up a boarding house assuring Matthew and Marilla that it was the very place for Anne. The lady who keeps it is a reduced gentlewoman, she expl explained Miss Barry. Her husband was a British officer, and she is very careful of what sort of boarder she takes in. Anne will not meet with any objectionable, undesirable, offensive persons under her roof. The table is good, so the food on the table is good. And the house is near the academy in a quiet neighborhood. All this might be true and indeed proved to be so, but it did not materially help Anne in the first agony of homesick that seized upon her. She looked dismally about her narrow little room with its dull papered pictureless walls, its small iron bedstead and empty bookcase, and a horrible choke came into her throat. And as she thought of her own white room at Green Gables, where she would have the pleasant consciousness of a great green still outdoors, of sweet peas growing in the garden, and moonlight falling on the orchard, of the brook below the slope, and the spruce boughs tossed in the night wind beyond it, of the a vast starry sky and the light from Diana's window shining out through the gap in the trees, here there was nothing of this. Anne knew that outside her window was a hard street with a network of telephone wires shutting out the sky. The tramp of alien feet. Um, tramp means to walk, tread, or step especially heavy, heavily. And a thousand lights gleaming on the strangers' faces. She knew that she was going to cry and fought against it. I won't cry. It's silly and weak. There's the third tear splashing down my nose. There are more coming. I must think of something funny to stop them. But there's noth nothing funny except what is connected with Avonlea, and that only makes things worse. Four, five, I'm going to go home next Friday, but this seems a hundred years away. Oh, Matthew is nearly home by now, and Merle is at the gate looking down the lane for him. Six. Seven, eight, oh, there's no use counting them. They're coming in a flood breeze up presently. I can't cheer up. I don't want to cheer up. It's nicer just to be miserable. The flood of tears would have come, no doubt, had not Josie Pye appeared at that moment. In the joy of seeing a familiar face, Anne forgot that there had never been much love lost between her and Josie. As a part of Avonlea life, even a pie was welcome. I'm so glad you came up, said Anne sincerely. You've been crying, remarked Josie with aggravating pity. Aggravating means arousing displeasure, impatience, or anger. I suppose you're homesick. Some people have so little self-control in that respect. I have no intention of being homesick. I can tell you. Town's too jolly after that pokey old Avonlea. I wonder how I ever existed there so long. You shouldn't cry, Anne. It isn't becoming for your nose and your eyes get red. And then you seem all red. I'd be, I'd a perfectly scrumptious time in the academy today. Our French professor is simply a duck. His mustache would give you kerwallops of the heart. What do you think kerwallops of the heart mean? What? 
Yeah, so if you've got ever like seen somebody like makes you go, oh, right? Sometimes your heart beats faster. So chorwallops of the heart means like your heart is jumping or maybe beating fast. Okay. Jumping or maybe beating fast. Have you anything edible around? And I'm literally starving. It, uh, I guess likely. Marilla loaded you up with cake. That's why I called round. Otherwise, I'd have gone to the park to hear the band play with Frank Stockley. He boards at the same place I do, and he's a sport. He noticed you in class today and asked me who the red-headed girl was. I told him you were the orphan that the Cuthberts had adopted. And nobody knew very much about where what you'd been before that. Anne was wondering if, after all solitude and tears, were not more satisfactory than Josie Pye's companionship when Jane and Ruby appeared, each with an inch of queen's color ribbon, purple and scarlet, pinned proudly to her coat. As Josie was not speaking to Anne just then, she had to subside into comparative harm. She had to subside into comparative harmlessness. Well, said Jane with a sigh, oh, I feel as if I'd lived many moons since this morning. I ought to be home studying my Virgil. Virgil. Uh, I think Virgil's a reference to somebody, um, I want to say he's a philosopher, but I'm not sure. The horrid old professor gave us 20 lines to start in on tomorrow. But I simply couldn't settle down to study tonight. And methinks I see traces of tears. You've been crying. Do own up. It will restore my self-respect. For I was shedding tears freely before Ruby came along. I don't mind being a goose so much as somebody else is goosey too. So what do you think goose means or goosey means in this case? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Might be something funny. Does that make sense? I don't mean being a funny so much if somebody else is going to be funny too. Yeah, sad or maybe like um, a lot of times you call them silly goose. Um, I don't mean I don't mean being a Goose, like being sentimental, maybe. You know what sentimental means? Sentimental. Like, I don't mind crying if somebody else is going to be crying too. Or I don't mind being emotional. I don't mind being emotional if somebody else is going to be emotional too. Okay? Cake? You'll give me a teeny piece, won't you? Thank you. It has the real Avonlea flavor. Ruby, perceiving the queen's calendar lying on the table, wanted to know if Anne meant to try for the gold medal. Anne blushed and admitted she was thinking about it. Oh, that reminds me, said Josie. Queen's is to get one of the Avery scholarships after all. The word came today. Frank Stockley told me his uncle is on... Is one of the board. His uncle is one of the board of governors. You know, it will be announced in the academy tomorrow. An Avery scholarship. Anne's heart beat more quickly, and the horizons of her ambition shifted and broadened, as if by magic. Before Josie had told the news, Anne's highest pinnacle of aspiration had been a teacher's provi provincial license. First class at the end of the year, and then perhaps the medal. But now, in one moment, Anne saw herself winning the Avery Scholarship, taking an arts course at Redmond College, and graduating in a gown and mortarboard 
So the, the mortar board would be the cap that you see people wearing. This four-sided square cap for cap and gown, right? Uh, another name for it is motor board. Uh, before the echo of Josie's words had died away. For the Avery scholarship was in English, and Anne felt that here her foot was on native hearth. A wealthy manufacturer of New Brunswick had died and left part of his fortune to endow or fund a large number of scholarships to be distributed among the various high schools and academies of the maritime provinces. Maritime means marine or water provinces. So uh, provinces that are surrounded by water. According to their respective standings, there had been much doubt whether one would be allotted to Queens, but the matter was settled at last, and the end of the year, the graduate who made the highest marks in English and English literature would win the scholarship. $250 a year for four years. So it sounds like the scholarship would pay for college for four years for somebody. At Redmond College, no wonder that Anne went to bed that night with a tingling in her cheeks. I'll win that scholarship if hard work can do it, she resolved. Wouldn't Matthew be proud if I got to be a B.A.? B.A. is Bachelor of Arts. Um, it's a three or four year degree. Most of the time it's a four year degree. And teachers degrees nowadays are four and a half to five year program usually. Hang on. So um, a teacher's degree, so the BA stands for Bachelor of Arts. Um, a teacher's degree right now would take you us minimum usually four years. Um, uh, most programs are four and a half years now or five years. Okay. All right. Um, I am not going to get started on the next chapter. So what I am going to do is we're going to run through questions really quick. Uh, you do know four because it's part of chapter 34, but let's see. What does... What does Matthew mean when he said there were never there was never a luckier mistake than when what Mrs. Spencer made? What does Marilla do after she left? Why wasn't Anne able? Let's do one and three. All right. So one and three. Please make sure you answer all parts of the questions, and please make sure that you use race because I have some people that have been giving me sentences they're complete sentences but they're not using race so I'm dinging you a half a point if you're not using a complete sentence all right we'll challenge